Hi everyone, I'm Helen, a 31-year-old from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm contemplating a change of scenery soon. My journey has been a bit of a roller coaster, particularly enduring a challenging marriage for over a year. Thankfully, with my dad and some help from law enforcement, I managed to navigate my way out. Looking back, I recognize my role in those choices and sometimes wish I had been more discerning. I've always been quite reserved and not much of a social butterfly, preferring the company of my computer and the vast digital universe over real-life interactions. On the rare occasions I did step out, like going to a bar. I'd keep to myself, especially when strangers attempted to befriend me. The thought of being kidnapped by someone I barely knew was enough to keep me at a distance. My mother passed away when I was just five due to a heart condition that went untreated, leaving me in the sole care of my father, a dedicated Marine. His job took him away on long voyages, leaving me to miss him dearly. Despite the distance, he did his best to stay connected with us through letters and calls. The day we lost my mom, he rushed back to comfort me, finding me inconsolable at her funeral. He lifted me into his arms, offering comfort and promising that everything would be okay now that he was back. Clinging to him, I cried myself to sleep that night, lulled by the sound of his voice humming my favorite lullaby. His strength and love have been my guiding light through the darkest times, teaching me resilience and hope. I remember seeing him once, sitting quietly by himself on the sofa with a drink in his hand. He looked so forlorn and pale, occasionally whispering to himself before he buried his face into a cushion and wept. It was only the second time I'd ever seen him cry the first being when I had a little accident on a slide and ended up getting hurt. Perhaps he felt guilty about everything that had unfolded in our lives. He decided to take a couple of months off work, and before he left again, he made arrangements for me to stay with my grandmother, who would look after me in his absence. Yes, Dad, I will, I assured him, my heart heavy with his impending departure. He expressed his eagerness to taste the dishes I would learn to make by the time he came back. Then, with a final hug and a promise to take care of myself, he was gone. His work meant he would be away for five months or more, during which he'd send me gifts and souvenirs from his travels. While he was gone, I helped Grandma with the household chores and kept to myself, preferring the solitude of our home over the company of other kids. As I grew older, this preference for solitude deepened, and I found solace in the virtual world, where I could interact with others without the anxiety that real-world interactions brought. The internet became my window to the world, a place where I could explore endless stories and connect with people on a level I found both exhilarating and comforting. I didn't need to face anyone directly. I could share my thoughts, feelings, and interests anonymously, finding friends who understood and accepted me. Through these digital connections, I encountered diverse cultures and perspectives, realizing how much we all have in common despite our apparent differences. The internet bridged the gap between continents, making the world a smaller, more interconnected place. During this virtual exploration, I met Joseph, a streamer. Our friendship began with chats and progressed to video calls. Though we both kept our identities somewhat concealed, I wore a Batman mask, and he used a scarf and a beanie to obscure his face. Hi, Helen. It's great to finally see you, he greeted me during two of our calls. Hello, Jose. Nice to meet you, even if it's just virtually, I replied, my voice tinged with nervous excitement. He assured me it was normal to feel nervous, but promised it would get easier with time. Our conversations were a mixture of everyday banter and deeper discussions, a testament to the strange yet wonderful friendships formed in the age of the internet. Don't worry, I don't bite. I guess we're both a bit awkward, huh? It's our first real conversation, after all. I started breaking the ice as we delved into our first significant chat. So, Joes, I'm curious. What brought you to this online world? Jose shared his enthusiasm for meeting new people and discovering diverse viewpoints. I'm a bit of a homebody, and this digital community felt like the right place to connect with others from the comfort of my own space. How about you? I admitted to my introverted nature, explaining how traditional social settings felt daunting, and how online platforms offered a layer of comfort that made it easier for me to express myself. I find these virtual connections incredibly rewarding. 
It's serendipitous that we met here, I added. Our conversation flowed effortlessly, filled with exchanges of interests and personal anecdotes. I found myself relaxing more with each topic we covered. I never imagined I'd be this at ease talking to someone over the internet. Thanks for making it so seamless, Josie. This means a lot to me. The feeling's mutual, Helen. You're an excellent conversationalist, and I'm glad we connected. If you ever feel like chatting again, just hit me up. I'm usually around playing games. Oh, do you game? Jose asked, his curiosity peaking. I'd like that, I replied. But no, I'm more into blogging and browsing Reddit. It's fascinating what you can discover there. I often find myself learning more from the experiences shared by others than anything else. Exactly. Sometimes our own lives can feel so mundane. There's something special about diving into the lives of others online. I find myself trusting my internet friends more than my real-life ones, Jose confessed. He appreciated the no-strings-attached nature of online friendships where you're free to engage as much or as little as you prefer. As our conversation unfolded, Jose and I formed a genuine bond, a friendship that felt real despite the digital barrier. Our open-mindedness and mutual understanding highlighted the unique connection you can find in the least expected places. This digital journey of mine has undoubtedly shaped my identity and the way I approach the world. The lessons and experiences from my online haven have become an integral part of who I am. However, my dad, ever cautious, would likely disapprove of these unseen friendships. The last time he visited, he took the opportunity to lecture me on the importance of real-world connections over dinner. How are your studies going, Dove? He had asked, unaware of my recent graduation, a milestone he missed. Our conversation hinted at the gaps in our real-life interactions, underscoring the complexities of my digital and physical worlds colliding. I was swamped with responsibilities and felt bad about it then, just as I do now. I even sent you an email to let you know I'd make it for your birthday tomorrow. Tomorrow's my pumpkin's birthday. Ah, uh, please don't use nicknames. I'm not five anymore, I had to remind him, though he still sees me as his little dove. That's just it, Dad. I don't know how to, but I'll try. I do have friends, but they're online, I admitted. Why bring Mom into this? What are you implying? I snapped hurt by the direction of our conversation. I'm not implying anything, dear. I'm just saying it's important to find ways to move forward, as much as we both miss her, he gently explained. But I couldn't contain my frustration. I slammed the table, got up without finishing my meal, and stormed off to wash my plate, leaving my dad trying to reach out. Helen, don't take that tone with your father. I'm just trying to help, he said, his voice a mix of concern and disappointment. You don't understand me, so don't try, I retorted, anger boiling over. I retreated to my online world to find Josie, someone who seemed to understand. Jose was kind and a good listener, someone I could vent to about the growing frustration within me. Being an introvert, I've always found solace and comfort at home, in front of my computer screen. While others embraced the world outside, I cherished the safety of my digital haven, a place where I could be myself without the anxiety of real interactions. My father, however, couldn't grasp this. He believed my preference for online life was limiting my personal growth and insisted I experience the world beyond my comfort zone, a thought that filled me with dread. I shared my worries with Joseph, hoping he'd grasp the situation I was in. Hey, Helen, would you like to meet in person? We're both introverts so we could pick a quiet place with few people around. I know just the spot, he suggested gently, understanding my need for a comfortable setting. No worries, take all the time you need. I'm here whenever you're ready. Here's my address. You're always welcome, Joseph offered, extending an invitation with patience and kindness. Why are you so nice to me? I'm practically a stranger. I couldn't help but wonder aloud. Because I genuinely like you. It might sound odd coming from me but I'd love to get to know you better. Whenever you feel the same, you know where to find me, he responded with sincerity, making my heart flutter with a mixture of surprise and curiosity. The thought of stepping out into the real world to meet Joseph was daunting. Yet filled with a blend of excitement and anxiety, I found myself outside his home, 
ready to face the unknown. He lived surprisingly close, just a 35-minute drive away. I gathered my courage, took a deep breath, and knocked on the weathered door. It creaked open, and there was Joseph with a welcoming smile that immediately calmed my nerves. He was charming, and his home, though modest, radiated a warmth and genuine character. The cozy interior adorned with beloved books, board games, and his personal workspace spoke volumes about his personality. Welcome to my humble abode, Joseph greeted, his voice filled with an eagerness that made me smile. Your gracious presence brightens my day. I chuckled at his gaming lingo. Thank you. It's quite a cozy place. Do you live here alone? No, my princess. I share the house with my mom. She stays downstairs, while I have the top floor to myself. Let me give you a tour, he offered, leading me through a space. As the day unfolded, we engaged in deep conversations, shared laughter, and discovered even more about one another. Meeting Joseph in person added a new dimension to our relationship, deepening the bond we had formed online. His kindness and authenticity were even more palpable face to face enriching our connection and making me appreciate the person behind the digital persona even more. Josie's unique humor and genuine nature drew me closer to him as we spent more time together. One evening, as the sunset painted the sky with shades of orange and purple, he suggested a walk in the nearby park. I found myself eagerly agreeing, my earlier nerves melting away into comfort and ease. Walking with him felt like a natural continuation of our online conversations now enriched with the immediacy and depth that only face-to-face -face interactions can provide. During our walk, I confided in him about not celebrating my birthday, explaining how a recent argument with my dad left me feeling too unsettled to face any celebration. I'm really sorry to hear that, but I believe he'll understand in time. He's your dad, after all. Jose tried to comfort me. However, as Jose and I grew closer, I began to see another side of him. Despite his sweet words at first, he became possessive and jealous once we started dating. He demanded constant communication, reacting with anger if I spoke to others. His claims of love and protection seemed sincere at first, but I soon questioned why I had so readily believed him. To my dismay, I learned his mother disapproved of our relationship. Knowing she harbored negative feelings towards me, someone she hadn't met, was disheartening. I struggled to understand her stance given the genuine care and love Jose and I shared. His close bond with his mother was clear, and while I respected their relationship, it introduced a wedge between us. Despite Jose's assurances, I felt like an outsider, caught in the shadow of his mother's disapproval. The most confusing aspect was her contradicting attitude towards our future. She seemed to push for our marriage, perhaps seeing me as someone who could cater to her needs, given my lack of family support. This perspective was a stark contrast to the understanding I sought from a potential mother-in-law. Not every parent is perfect. Look at your dad, for instance. At least my mom cares about me, Jose would say, failing to see how his words stung. His remarks about my father not loving me were especially painful. Please, Josie, it hurts when you talk like that. You know how complex my relationship with my dad is? I pleaded, seeking empathy. In this tangled web of emotions and relationships, I found myself questioning the very foundations of our connection. The love and understanding I initially felt from Jose now seemed overshadowed by possessiveness, jealousy, and familial complications. I tried to adapt to stop lamenting my situation and aim to make the best of things. Despite the foreboding sense of unease, I ended up in a clandestine marriage with Joseph. He convinced me that my father would never accept our union, persuading me that my dad's absence was a sign of his lack of love. So, without inviting my dad or anyone else from my side, I married Joseph, stepping into a situation I sensed was fraught with risk. I criticized myself for my lack of strength, attributing my vulnerabilities to the environment I grew up in rather than acknowledging the manipulation I was under. The marriage soon revealed a harsher side of Joseph's mother than I had ever imagined. She embodied cruelty, taking delight in undermining my confidence and joy. Her tactics were insidious at first, snide remarks and demeaning comments that gradually eroded my self-esteem. I held on to the hope that her animosity would diminish over time, 
but it only escalated into relentless emotional abuse. Her criticisms were relentless. This meal is a disgrace. You expect my son to eat this? Start over, she would sneer. Or, this place is filthy. Are you incapable of cleaning properly? And get up and take out the trash. Were you raised with no manners at all? Each word from her was like a blow, designed to belittle me and shake my sense of self-worth. She questioned my decisions, dismissed my accomplishments, and manipulated situations to make me feel unworthy of Joseph's love. Meanwhile, Joseph remained oblivious or indifferent, absorbed in his own world, leaving me to fend for myself in this toxic environment. I felt trapped in a never-ending nightmare, my spirit and resilience wearing thin under the constant barrage of cruelty. The regret of pushing my father away haunted me. His departure after a heated argument right before this entire ordeal left me feeling isolated and full of remorse. I berated myself for my perceived weaknesses, for allowing myself to be drawn into this situation. One day, feeling under the weather and overwhelmed by everything, I sought solace in a nap on the sofa, hoping to find some reprieve in sleep, but any chance of rest was abruptly shattered when a cold splash of water jolted me awake, a harsh reminder of the relentless hostility that had become my daily reality. Waking up in a state of shock and fear, I found myself facing Anne, my mother-in-law, who looked at me with utter disdain. Why are you loafing on the sofa? Did you even bother to do the shopping I asked you to? Her voice dripped with contempt. I remained silent, unable to respond to her accusations. So, you expect me, an old woman, to handle everything while you do nothing? She sneered before striking me across the face and calling for Joseph. I reached my breaking point. I refuse to do anything more for you or your son. I'm done being treated like this. Find someone else to torment, I declared, my patience exhausted. I'd received nothing but disrespect from this family, and I couldn't stand it any longer. As I attempted to leave, a blunt object struck me from behind and darkness engulfed me. When consciousness returned, I found myself in a dimly lit semi-dark room pain throbbing through my head. Struggling to stand, I stumbled, overwhelmed by pain and confusion about my whereabouts. Faint, distorted sounds grew clearer as they neared. Desperately, I crawled toward a metal door with a small window, using it to pull myself up. The door suddenly swung open, revealing Joseph with a mocking smile. Scared of the dark, are we? He taunted. I pleaded with him to let me out promising to change, to no longer voice any complaints. But his response was cold and merciless. This is your punishment for disrespecting my mother. You'll stay here, cut off from the world. After all, who's going to miss you? Your mother's gone and your father doesn't care about you. You had a chance to start anew here, but you've squandered it, he sneered. There, in the cold, dark basement, a mixture of fear and rage coursed through me. How had my life spiraled into this nightmare? All I had done was stand up against unjust demands, and now I was trapped, punished for seeking respect and dignity. In the depths of my despair, feeling the consequences of asserting myself, I discovered my phone in my pocket. It was damaged. Its screen barely alive, yet a glimmer of hope sparked within me. Amidst the darkness, the faint light of the screen blinked back at me. With my father's number etched in my memory, I dialed it, my hands shaking and tears blurring my vision. I recounted my ordeal through a trembling voice, clinging to the slim chance that he could rescue me from this terror. Three days later, as despair nearly claimed me, the sound of a car outside signaled a sliver of hope. My heart raced as I listened for the footsteps approaching. The door finally opened to reveal my father, a pillar of strength and resolve. The sight of him flooded me with a mix of relief and disbelief. He had come to my rescue, bringing police officers with him. Jose and Anne were quickly apprehended, their feeble attempts to deny their actions falling flat. You have no idea what's waiting for you in court, my dad declared with rightful anger. Despite their protests and excuses, their fate was sealed. As my dad led me out of that dark, confining space, I felt a surge of courage and resolve. The harrowing experience, though far from easy, had revealed an inner strength I didn't know I possessed. 
With my father's steadfast support, I emerged ready to face any challenge that lay ahead. I resolved then to always stand up for myself, to never again let anyone silence my voice. The hope for justice burned within me, a wish to see Jose and his mother face the consequences of their actions. I decided to start anew, leaving Jacksonville for Augusta, Georgia with my dad, seeking safety and a fresh start away from the memories that haunted me. This ordeal also taught me a valuable lesson about the dangers of trusting strangers online. A lesson I'll carry with me always. My name is Karen, and I am a 38-year-old office worker. I have been married to Paul for three years, who I met through a family friend. My family is somewhat wealthy, and since my sister Janet and I are the only children, our relatives were concerned about who would inherit our family's assets. This is why they introduced me to Paul. Paul moved in with us at my family home shortly after we met. My mom had passed away a few years before, so it was just my dad, my husband, and me living together. Paul was very nice and took good care of my father. However, the family friend who introduced us warned me just before our wedding that Paul was very interested in money. This worried me, but Paul didn't show any signs of greed, so we got married. Even so, I kept an eye on him because of what the family friend said. Paul didn't seem greedy, but he was curious about my father's wealth. He often asked about it casually when he and my father were drinking together, but since my father spoke openly about it, I wasn't too concerned. Paul also took an interest in my sister Janet, who is six years younger than me and very lively and outgoing, unlike my calm nature. Janet has flashy relationships with men and looks quite different from me, which surprised Paul when he first saw her. Watching Paul be fascinated by Janet, who was so different from me, made me feel uneasy. One day, when Paul found out I couldn't inherit my father's estate, he yelled at me, You can't inherit the property. I have no use for you anymore. We're getting divorced right now. Later, after he remarried, I got my revenge on him and my sister. At first, I believed that having a beautiful sister meant there was nothing to worry about. But I eventually realized the reasons behind our relatives' concerns. My father doted on my sister, providing her with every opportunity, including the chance to attend both college and community college after graduating. However, my sister lacked a clear purpose for her education. She seemed mainly interested in avoiding work. Our mother tried to encourage her to get a job immediately after her first college graduation, but my father supported her decision to continue her education at community college. After completing her studies there, she secured a position at a company owned by one of my father's acquaintances. This job, however, lasted only six months. She resigned with the unexpected excuse that she couldn't showcase her talents at that workplace. Both my mother and I were taken aback. My sister spoke as if she fully understood the job, despite her minimal experience. My father, ever her supporter, quickly found her another job. It wasn't long after she started this new role that my mother fell ill and was hospitalized. During this time, my sister visited her daily, frequently taking time off from her new job. She eventually resigned from this position too, claiming she needed to care for our mother. But her idea of care involved mostly chatting with our mother or being engrossed in her mobile phone in the waiting room. I found myself handling practical tasks, such as changing my mother's hospital laundry, while my sister offered little real assistance. It may have been comforting for my mother to have company, but her condition deteriorated about a month after she was hospitalized. She soon reached a point where she could no longer speak. Within three weeks of her condition worsening, my mother passed away. The suddenness of her passing left both my father and sister too shaken to even prepare for the funeral. This left a significant burden on me during an already difficult time. After my mother passed away, I found myself handling all the arrangements. Fortunately, our relatives helped, and we were able to bid farewell to her peacefully. In the wake of this, my sister took on a part-time job and moved into her own place. However, 
her earnings from the job weren't sufficient to cover her rent and other living expenses. Consequently, our father stepped in, covering her rent and utility bills, while the money she made was mostly spent on her leisure activities. Whenever her part-time income proved inadequate, she would turn to our father for additional financial support. Under our mother's watch, such requests were kept in check as she was strict about financial discipline with my sister. However, after her death, my father began to indulge these requests, providing whatever money my sister asked for without hesitation. Initially, I saw no issue with this setup, assuming both my father and sister were content. Even after marrying and living with my husband in my parents' home, this financial arrangement continued. Unknown to me at the time, my sister also began asking my husband for money, and he complied, often asking her to keep it a secret to avoid causing me any jealousy. He found it difficult to say no to my attractive sister and willingly contributed to her expenses. My sister essentially lived off the money she received from both my father and my husband, engaging with her part-time job only sporadically, according to her whims. This unsustainable lifestyle came to an abrupt end when our father became ill and required hospitalization. I stepped in to care for him, balancing hospital visits with my work responsibilities. Despite the severity of our father's condition, my sister never appeared at the hospital. Instead, she began calling me, aggressively demanding money. She argued that since she had been receiving a regular allowance from our father, I should continue providing for her as before, stating that her rent and utilities were still being deducted from our father's account. Her tone was confrontational, and I was stunned by these revelations. I became infuriated by her selfish attitude, focused solely on maintaining her own lifestyle while completely disregarding our father's well-being in the hospital. The situation exposed a painful truth about my sister's priorities and strained our relationship even further. I was tempted to hang up on her, but she sounded like she was in trouble. So I asked her, how much money has dad been giving you every month? And suggested, get a full-time job and support yourself with what you earn. My sister responded irritably, stop nagging. I was getting a thousand dollars a month and remember, rent is separate. I was shocked by her response. She seemed proud of the amount and it made me think that if I continued to give her this much money each month, she would never be motivated to work seriously. At first, I didn't see a problem with giving her money, thinking my father would soon recover from his hospitalization. But then his condition took a turn for the worse, and I quickly reached out to our relatives. The doctor confirmed it was serious, which shocked me. During this stressful time, I needed my husband's support, but he rarely visited the hospital, claiming he was busy with work. When he did visit, he asked inappropriate questions like, Frank's estate must be huge, right? Since you and your sister are the only heirs, are you going to split it in half? I was speechless. My husband seemed only interested in the inheritance, and I felt a mix of realization and disgust, understanding what the relatives meant when they said he was obsessed with money. When I called my sister to inform her of our father's critical condition, her only concern was about her finances. Make sure you pay me every month. I can't live without that money, she demanded. The call ended suddenly, leaving me furious at her words. But I was also worried because I thought I heard a faint male voice in the background. I felt uneasy when I heard a familiar voice on the other end of the phone. About a month later, my father passed away. Sadly, neither my sister nor my husband was with him in his last moments. From my experience with my mother's funeral, I knew how tough it was to organize one. Neither my husband nor my sister offered any help, and my sister didn't even come to the funeral. My husband did show up but left quickly, claiming he had work. A relative who had introduced us asked me, Where's Paul? It's odd for the husband not to be here, isn't it? I just gave a forced smile and said he was busy with work and had gone home. The relative seemed disappointed, and I felt like sighing too. After my father's funeral, when I finally had a moment to myself, 
My husband asked me with a sly smile, so how much did you inherit? Even if you split it, you must have gotten a lot, right? Just like the relatives had warned before our marriage, he was only interested in my father's inheritance. I told him, looking straight at him, my sister got $100 million and I got nothing. I hadn't even spoken to the lawyer yet and was still dealing with the funeral. Seeing my husband so excited about the inheritance almost made me laugh rather than angry. Believing what I said, he immediately shouted, What? You can't inherit any property. I don't need you anymore. Let's get divorced now. I felt the same way. So I snapped back. Let's do it. You married me for my father's inheritance anyway. I handed him the divorce papers I had prepared. He seemed surprised, as if he hadn't expected this but he signed them anyway. As he left the house after signing the divorce papers, he said bitterly, I'll divorce you, who gets zero, and remarry your sister Janet, who gets the $100 million, and then he left. I didn't care what he said and went ahead with the divorce, happy to be rid of my awful husband. It seemed like he started trying to marry my sister the very next day. A few days later, he called me, demanding, do you still believe that story? When will you sort out the inheritance? Hurry up and give Janet the $100 million dollars. He shouted this over the phone. I had been waiting for him to contact me because I didn't want to reach out first after you left. I answered him calmly, let's discuss this at my place next Sunday. I'm preparing for the procedure and we'll be waiting. Thinking he was about to receive the inheritance, my ex-husband happily ended the call. However, I was actually looking forward to seeing his reaction when he discovered the truth. On the weekend, my ex-husband and my sister came to my family home and were surprised to see a lawyer there. My ex tried to act normal, thinking, of course you need a lawyer when inheriting a lot of money. Then the lawyer looked puzzled at my ex-husband and began, compensation claim. Before we talk about any inheritance, we need to address Karen's compensation claim against Paul. The lawyer then showed my ex-husband several photos of him leaving my sister's house, clearly dated before our divorce was finalized. These are evidence of infidelity, the lawyer told him, so you owe compensation. I had overheard him discussing the inheritance with my sister and had asked the lawyer to look into his infidelity. They might have thought I was too distracted by my father's funeral, but my ex-husband and sister were meeting at her place almost daily, giving me plenty of evidence. The topic quickly shifted from inheritance to compensation, leaving my ex-husband and sister shocked. However, my ex-husband recovered quickly and scoffed. Compensation is nothing compared to the $100 million from the inheritance. I'll pay it right away. He then signed the compensation documents provided by the lawyer, trying to appear unconcerned and confident. I confirmed everything and told him, enjoy your life with my sister, who inherited nothing. Since you signed, I'll make sure you pay the compensation. When they heard there was no inheritance, my sister screamed in shock, and her husband turned bright red, angrily saying, there's no way the inheritance is zero. I won't let you take it all for yourself. The lawyer then calmly began to explain to the furious couple, Janet is technically the stepdaughter of your late mother and was not legally adopted by your late father. Therefore, there is no legal parent-child relationship and Janet cannot inherit anything from your father's estate. I'd also explain to my confused sister about our family history. When our parents remarried, Janet, you were about a year old so you probably don't remember. But I do. I was eight years old when our parents were married, and I was happy to suddenly have a sister. I never imagined that sister would end up taking my husband. Our parents had each had children from previous relationships, and someone thought it best for them to remarry. My mother treated me as if I were her own daughter, and my father was very fond of my sister. Maybe because she wasn't his biological daughter, he spoiled her a bit extra, wanting to make sure she felt loved. Although both our parents had children from previous marriages, my mother, who was suspected by some relatives of targeting our wealthy family's assets, 
refused to legally adopt my sister. The relatives only suggested marriage proposals for me because they knew I was the only one who could legally inherit my father's property. If our parents had had a child together, it might have made things even more complicated, but fortunately or unfortunately, they never did. Now, I understand why my father continued to support my sister financially, even after she grew up, he couldn't leave her any inheritance. I never legally adopted my mother, so legally, we weren't parent and child, but that never mattered in how we lived every day. It turns out that my parents had never explained to my sister that they were both previously married before they got together. She only learned this truth today. When my ex-husband realized the situation, his face quickly changed from bright red to pale blue. He had not only failed to secure any inheritance from my sister, but had also signed a document obligating him to pay compensation. Looking visibly shocked, my ex-husband asked me, was what you said about my sister getting $100 million and me getting nothing a lie. I struggled to hold back my laughter and replied, of course, it was a lie. I said it to get back at you for cheating on me. Plus, there's no such thing as a bankrupt estate worth $100 million. Even my wealthy father didn't have that kind of money. Suddenly, my sister, who had been quiet until then, screamed out, I've been relying on dad's inheritance and have been spending a lot. What about the money dad used to give me? Will Karen cover it now? I responded to my sister, who seemed panicked. You have a dependable husband now, so you shouldn't need that money anymore, should you? Let Paul take care of you. She turned to look at her pale-faced husband, who shook his head and said, I've also done a lot of shopping, expecting to receive the inheritance, so I can't afford it. Plus, I have the compensation to pay, so I'm financially stretched. At that point, my ex-husband began to apologize profusely to me, Karen, I'm really sorry. It was all my fault. Will you forgive me and consider starting over? Watching this scene, the lawyer had to stifle his laughter as he prepared to leave. The confidence and arrogance my ex-husband had shown upon arriving had completely evaporated and his deep apologies now seemed utterly absurd. After we finished our discussion, my ex-husband and my sister left the house looking defeated, and not long after, they divorced. My ex-husband, who had remarried with the intention of gaining an inheritance, suddenly found himself without interest in my sister once the prospect of money was gone. He even muttered to himself that, with the compensation payments he owed me, he couldn't possibly support my sister. With no assets to his name, it was decided that he would pay the compensation in installments from his monthly paycheck. The lawyer recommended this method as the most practical solution under the circumstances. After my father's passing, the consequences of his indulgent support became painfully apparent. My sister, who had grown accustomed to financial support from our father, found herself in an unenviable position. She was compelled to work part-time jobs, which barely paid enough to cover her daily expenses, let alone the mounting debts that loomed over her. Despite her efforts, the financial burden proved too heavy. Eventually, overwhelmed by the accumulating debt, she had no choice but to file for personal bankruptcy. In a desperate move to escape her financial woes, she gave up her condominium, disappearing without leaving a trace. As of now, her whereabouts remain unknown, leaving a void in the family that once depended on each other so deeply. The situation underscored a harsh reality. Our father's well-intentioned but ultimately misguided financial support had shielded my sister from the necessity of developing a work ethic and financial independence. This protection, while provided out of love, had left her ill-prepared for the harsh realities of adult life. As she struggled with part-time work and faced the consequences of accumulated debt, it became clear that she was not equipped to handle financial responsibilities on her own. As for myself, the aftermath of these family troubles and the dissolution of my marriage left me residing alone in the family home a house that now felt too large and empty echoing with memories of a happier, more intact family. 
The solitude, however, provided me with ample time for reflection. It became a period of self-discovery and reassessment of what I truly wanted out of life. During this introspective period, some well-meaning relatives suggested that perhaps the time had come for me to consider entering into a new relationship. They talked about introducing me to potential suitors, hoping that a new partnership might bring me happiness and stability. However, the bitter experience with my ex-husband, who had shown his true colors as someone more interested in financial gain than in genuine companionship, made me wary of repeating past mistakes. His betrayal had been a painful lesson in discernment, teaching me the importance of knowing someone's character and intentions thoroughly before making such a profound commitment. Determined to take control of my own destiny, I decided to decline the offers for my relatives to arrange introductions. The thought of being matched with another partner who might view me as merely a means to an end was intolerable. Instead, I resolved to find a partner on my own terms, guided by the lessons learned from my past experiences. This decision was empowering, marking a new chapter in my life where I could prioritize my own values and desires in a relationship. In embracing this newfound independence, I began to explore various avenues for meeting potential partners. Whether through social events, community activities, or even online dating platforms, I was committed to finding someone who shared my values, someone who sought a partner for the right reasons, valuing respect, honesty, and genuine affection above financial considerations. This journey was not just about finding a new partner, it was about reclaiming my autonomy and learning to trust again after betrayal. Each step forward was a reaffirmation of my ability to shape my future, a future where my choices would lead to genuine connections and real love, rather than transactional relationships defined by financial dependency. Thus, as I move forward, the lessons of the past remain with me a guide to avoiding the pitfalls that had once ensnared my family and me and a beacon towards a more hopeful and self-determined future.